of Virginia and I'm an anarchist and today I'm here on the 17th of September at the campus of ECU to spread some anarchy. Uh, I just wanted to mention that every Sunday, this is a reminder, every Sunday night at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time we host a Fight the Matrix discussion on Google Plus Hangouts uh, pretty much to serve our ideas and strategies and to how to end the state, how to end this, this tyranny of, of government, this uh, you know 3,000 year old religion and uh, hurting and harming and kidnapping and uh, murdering and, and you know you, you name it. You know, the, the way that they hurt and rob our happiness. And that's, that takes place every week. You know, um, so you can find me on Google Plus under my name, Cal Moline, and I usually start the, post up the link, also on Facebook, every 30 minutes before 10.30. So at 10 o'clock, you'll find the link at Brady and available. And uh, yeah, so please come join us, join the discussion, join the conversation. We're gonna start recording these live as well. And so yeah, just, just remember that, um, you know, the state is not gonna end itself. It's gonna take a lot of, a community of courageous individuals to kind of stand up for themselves, to stand up for their community, and to actually end the state in the, in the very environment that you live in. So thank you for joining, thank you for watching. Hopefully you enjoy the content. Please share and subscribe, and see you at the victory party. I'm on your side though. Yeah, You're my on side? side? Yeah, like, all right, cool, cool. I, I just wanna hear what you would Yeah, say, like, all right, cool, cool, all right, yeah, this yeah. is perfect. This is good, all right, come yeah. a little closer. You'll be fine, you'll be fine. Okay, yeah. all right, three simple questions, all right? And that's the hidden violence behind government, and that it only knows how to solve problems through one way, a singular way, and that's through the threat of and use of violence to solve any problems versus the plurality of non-violent solutions that us three already share, right? And so that's, so that's the matrix. That's the immorality. What's the it, thing, like the main thing that you're upset about though? Uh, all of it, all of it. Uh, it. We all have different preferences. We all have a different preference in the way that we, like anyone who can decide how best your life should be lived and the lifestyle you want to choose, it's you. No one else can, right? So I'm pretty much out here talking about this moral stance that us three already share against using violence to solve problems. That's called anarchy. Like in science, anions and cations. An means without. Right? Archy means rulers, political rulers, like monarchy, one political ruler. Anarchy means without political rulers. We can still have rules. We can still have a polycentric legal system outside of their monopoly on law. But we don't need the strangers arbitrarily dictating and deciding how best our lives should be lived. Right? Because that's what government is. Government is a monopoly on services that they force on you and force on you to pay for as well. Do you have any like anything? What else would we do? Like, all right, all right, great, great. All right, so, 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 yeah, perfect, perfect. All right, so the first step, of course, is you recognize, you see the matrix, you see the code, you see what government is. It's nothing but an inherent structure to centralize planning the the, the lives of everybody else. Um, pretty much, it's just controlled by a small group of people, small group of people in Congress, small group of people in City Council, and that's it. Strangers you've never met. Somehow they know how best their lives should be lived. Instead of so, the, the the first way to get out of that is first seeing that, and then you start in your own interpersonal relationships, right? Let's turn to a community and turn away from government. Right, you can look at um, like the KKK for example. Several decades ago, they numbered in the millions. Today, there's less than a thousand left, right? It's hard to recruit the youth. When you push values against violence forward, you know, it's, you can't go back. You know, when you see the matrix for what it is, you can't really, you can't plug yourself back in. Right? Even Cypher in the movie had difficulty in, in trying to do that, right? Yeah. You, you can't. You have to forget everything about truth. You have to forget about everything about well, what you know, your virtues that you already hold. Uh, so that's where it starts. In our own interpersonal relationships, uh, with the circle of friends that we do have, and it starts from there. And from there, it only increases, never goes back. A good example of this would be like uh, in Detroit. You guys hear what's happening in Detroit? Yeah, yeah with all foreclosing, yeah. so they all run down. Right, so they fall for bankruptcy. This, this, is, this is inevitable of any city that's controlled by government. This is why Europe is falling. Uh, Greece, Ireland, Iceland, all of them co collapsing like a roll of dominoes. Several cities in California are already falling for bankruptcy. Sacramento, Sacramento is next, Philadelphia is next. It becomes unsustainable because you can't keep stealing everyone's wealth to fund something that's unsustainable. But that's the goal though. They want you to be in debt, so you have to go back to work and then you continue working to pay off your debt. That's right? the whole point. Yeah. So they're succeeding, the system's succeeding in their goal. Yeah, they are, yeah. so that's, that's the only thing they're efficient in. Yeah. The only thing they're efficient in is pretty much causing ruin in your life. Yeah. Um, and it shouldn't be it shouldn't be that way. Like for example, you're forced when you were born, you didn't have a choice to say that you wanted social security or not. Mm -hmm. Right? But uh, when you were born here, now here you are, social security. You didn't have a choice to say whether you know you can be competent as a mature human being to save enough for a lifetime when you're ready to retire. But no, they force this on you and you have to pay for it. But we all know that's unsustainable. You'll never see social security in your life. You'll never have any of that payment and payout, you know, when you're when it's time for you to retire. 
So it's worse than a Ponzi scheme because at least in a Ponzi scheme, you can you can you can get out anytime. And you know being tricked. Right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, but you can't escape from that. You don't have the freedom to cancel, unsubscribe, or even have the freedom to create a better service that's not going to be harmful and abusive to the to the consumers, to you. Right? So without government, you'll have a free market. Uh, you, you, corporations will cease to exist. All a corporation is, is this a piece of paper that allows the, the person in charge of that corporation to escape personal liability and responsibility. But that's backed and enforced by government. Government grants these piece of papers to, to these companies to incorporate so they can take so much risk. It's like walking across the street with your eyes closed, knowing that you can't get hurt. Mm -hmm. Right? So the cost of corporations goes to the employees by lowering their salaries, it goes to consumers by raising consumer prices. So without government, no corporation, it goes back to the way it used to be, where people were responsible for their own choices, for their own actions, and then that's, that's how we improve, that's where we go there. It would be like uh, Netflix, like over a year ago, they tried to raise their prices overnight, and people are like, oh, forget that, no yeah. way, cancel, unsubscribe, go to Hulu, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So you have the freedom of power that is in your hand to say, you know, I don't like the service, sorry, it, it will go bankrupt tomorrow if they're not catering to your needs and preference, right? And that's how we become in control again. That's how we, how we become in charge, right? But you can't do that with government. You know, even if it's bad, even if they're they're already uh, throwing over a million people into cages for victimless crimes, um, you, you can't cancel. You can't withdraw your payment, right? You can't say uh, you, you don't even have the freedom to compete. You know, they even have a monopoly on something as ridiculous as delivering mail, pieces of paper, right? The U.S. Post Office they have a monopoly on first-class mail. USPS and FedEx can only deliver packages. If they try to deliver pieces of paper, they will be threatened and thrown into a cage, right? So that's the inherent violence up behind the monopoly that the government has. So without the government, we can still have security, we'll have roads, we'll have all this wonderful stuff that we want, but at least in the direction where you want to channel and who, and who can best serve your needs and your preference the best, right? Uh, yeah? All right, cool. Yeah, my name is Cal, by the way. I'm Keon. Keon? Yeah. Bara. Pleasure. Bara, pleasure. pleasure. Yeah. Well, well, let me give you some pamphlets then. Here you go. Uh, we meet up, uh, what? Oh, the same? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's two different ones. Well, this one's peaceful parenting because it all ties in. You can't just say we're against state violence, but you have to be against yeah, all violence. The first right? step is in your, in your own life. Right? Yeah. yeah, of course. That's where change begins then. I loved it. Thank all right, so great, much. man. Thank all you right. for stopping. Nice you. you too, you too. Take care. Right? You have no freedom of economic choice. You still have to give them your money. You still have to give them your property. You still have to pay your taxes. Because if you did have a freedom of economic choice, they wouldn't threaten to send you to another cage if you didn't pay your taxes. Well, right? What would you think of the better solution? All right, so the better solution is first you recognize that the government only knows how to solve problems the one way though, a singular way, and that's through the threat of and use of violence to solve any problems versus the plurality of nonviolent solutions that you and I already share here. Right? But no person would take you seriously if you did not use violence. That's the only problem. If it was not as if... What do you mean with no one took it seriously? If people could convince people, other people, to just follow what is the now and time of law, there wouldn't be a problem. But yet there is. People don't follow gun laws. People, the reason why there are gun laws and stuff like that is to prevent from people, other people getting hurt. But yet people like an AK-14... Why do you need an AK-14? There, Someone explained to me they want an AK-14 to shoot a wolf. Right. Where are there wolves? Right, right, right. No, I, I agree, I agree. Okay, okay, all right. So gun control is an interesting thing. So I, I wanted to talk about it. That's very, very important too, especially what was just happened in uh, D.C. yesterday. Um, so you realize what government is. They have a monopoly though on law. They yes. have a monopoly on services they force on you to, to accept and pay for. You don't have the freedom to unsubscribe, cancel your payment, or even have the freedom to create better service that's not going to be harmful and abusive to the consumer, you, who are paying for those salaries and that service. Right? They have a monopoly on courts, on judges, on security, on roads, on even first class mail, right? Uh, so, we're talking about um, gun laws, for example. So what gun laws really is, the advocation for gun laws is like, what you're, what people are really advocating for, they're, they're for guns, but they're for governments to have guns and not anyone else. So you're for people having guns to take away the guns of other people. I'm for a regular, I, I'm not really yeah, 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 yeah. Guns, but I'm for having a rifle or something like that, but at the same time, as I said, AK-14, there are people that want no laws right, against right, right, guns. Right. Like the NRA, they, to a certain extent, they believe that the government's going to take away all guns, but right. that's not true. 
they just want a little bit more security because of everything that's happening like yesterday right and it doesn't work out both ways like some people want the middle yeah. but most people want the opposite yeah. ends so no one can really meet in the middle right 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 it's such a big problem with it. it is so you just you're to find a big problem with government then yeah. is that they can only force one preference yeah. onto yeah. everyone yeah. either everybody likes yeah. guns or they hate guns right yeah. uh, so, so that's, that's where i find the problem with. they don't allow uh, the division to associate and disassociate. So government forces one preference in a geographic region. So without government, you would have rich, diverse communities of different rules. You won't have a polycentric legal system outside of the monopoly law. So you can have a community that says no guns allowed. You can have a community on the other side that says yeah, guns allowed. But what, when it comes time that there's no government and that side that has the guns, and people, they don't believe in guns, yeah. and they don't believe in something that the other side is doing, they would enforce their belief because they Why? are... <laughs> So not based on guns, right. based on what something else they don't agree on, like just stereotyping guns is what I believe. Most people that believe in a lot of having more guns and not being restricted mm -hmm. also believe that abortion is wrong yeah. or certain things like that. They're more on the conservative side. So they don't think that anybody should be allowed to have an abortion. Like there was a time in Louisiana that there was no place to get an abortion because the law said that only certain clinics, right. like they, just Louisiana, certain clinics could, um, only the approved doctors could have give abortions. And right. those approved doctors didn't give abortions. So the people that actually wanted to give abortions were not approved and it legally, they would be put in jail for trying to give abortions. Yeah. Because they were trying to enforce their belief on somebody else. Right. So there wouldn't be exactly both trying to meet in the middle because they don't want the other to have their way. Right. And I think for, yeah, and so what, yeah. what you find for government is that they're trying to force the preferences onto each other. And that's yeah. why they're trying to NRA is trying to do it to the government because they feel that uh, other people are going to use the government and force their guns away from their hands. Right. So that's what government is. You, they force us to to attack each other. It becomes political warfare. You know, and trying to fly for that for that seat of power to force that preference onto everyone else and that's why people are involved in that and that's what I'm trying to say without government you wouldn't have that you have the freedom you're right you, you can have an apartment complex that's 420 friendly one across the street that's not right <laughs> because I think that's the only reason why people are so uh, agitated and, and hate a lot of other people is because th there's the political power that can force them at any moment to force their preferences onto them yes. but most people just want to do is just be left alone right left alone with their own gun on their own property great you know they're not gonna go anywhere hard anyone they just don't want anyone to force that preference or hurt you know take that gun away from them I mean, there's the stick that's out there already that says, I mean, pretty much, I mean, I don't own a gun, but for the most part, it says that um, places that have the most restrictive gun laws in the country, you have the most amount of crimes. But the but it's, it's directly the opposite and the inverse. The places that have the least amount of gun laws actually have the lowest amounts of, of crime. That's interesting. Uh, so you look like the Arola, uh Colorado shooting at the movie theaters. Out of all the movie theaters you could have gone to, he went to the only one that said no guns allowed. So of course they have a preference, so we'll select naturally to the place in the community where they can defend themselves, right? Um, so, so it's an interesting, uh, I guess, uh, you look at the statistics with that. But again, I, I agree with you, whether someone wants guns or not, so, hey, that, it's, just a, it's just an item, it's just an object. It has, really has to come back to the human being, the individual, and that's their preference, that they don't want to be other people to force upon them and not for them to force it onto others. Uh, so I guess pretty much, the, or I guess I guess the point of all this that I'm trying to make is, uh, so this, um, I guess, moral stance that you and I already share, against using violence to solve problems. That's called anarchy. Like for example, like in science, anions and cations, an means without, archy means political rulers, right? Uh, monarchy means one political ruler. Anarchy means without political rulers. Without strangers, a government arbitrarily dictating, deciding how best your life should be lived. You can still have rules. We can still have a polycentric legal system. So how would we do without a government? Okay. And then say another government want to come in. Right. All right, all right. All right, great, great, great for us. Okay, all right, so two big two big things. Uh, one, so you don't have a government, you no longer have a tax system. The only reason governments take over other geographic regions is to take over the tax system. The only reason Hitler wanted to take over France so fast was to take over the existing tax structure. Because then you already have a culture that it's already was born into giving up a lot of the property, they're gonna keep funding this war machine. Uh, that's why they call uh, Afghanistan the um, the graveyard of empires, because there's really no tax system to take over. Russia's couldn't do it, the Mongols couldn't do it, the US still can't do it, there's nothing to take over. Uh, so without a tax system, there's no incentive to take over. 
Uh, but there would be casual, like, yeah, yeah. there would be a lot of casualties based on not having a base of defense from your taxes. Right, so we can still have security. Uh, so we, we can still have all these services, but at least it could be you're in charge. Like Netflix trying to raise their prices overnight, people say... But who would pay, like... You, 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 I mean, you, all right, so for example, uh, I mean, you, you wouldn't have to. Uh, it could, there would still be non-profit organizations. Just like for the question, like, well, what about the poor? The fact that you ask that question implies you care about the poor. What about national defense? There'll still be organization out there that still wants to help. There'll still be, hey, fund us, we'll provide a uh, better security, better national defense. Uh, because, I mean, I was in the military. Their research, though, how would they expand their research without the money that we pay with our taxes that give them millions and millions right, of dollars? Right, right, right. You'll still have philanthropists. Like, uh, no, that's true. Right? <laughs> you have uh, Bill Gates, largest philanthropist in the world, gives his money wherever he can. So you have, uh, you have that singer, um, uh, he wears these glasses. Uh, wow, what's his name? Hey. It was what's this, he saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he well, so he's just saying that uh, capitalism is the way to help people. You know, like for example, impoverished nations, like especially in Africa, you don't just give them money. You kind of help them grow their business. You kind of help them become entrepreneurs. Not trying to give away free stuff because then you can. Because if you give a lot of free clothing, for example, the the person who has a business and trying to create clothing as a business, the, uh, you know, he sees out of the business because why why pay when everything's given for free, right? So so pretty much just trying to help people on their feet, trying to help people, I guess, how to fish, how to how to grow, how to become entrepreneurs is how you help people. Uh, uh, not to uh, sustain, I guess, some of those habits that people sometimes have. Like, for, for example, like the welfare system. You want to help the poor, uh, and some people become involuntary poor out of, you know, wife just died, just lost their job. And those are the people who want to help. Not people who have certain addictions, and we still want to give them help, but throwing money at them is not the kind of help we want to give them, you know? The thing with the police is, like, I feel like if it wasn't owned by the government, they would have more freedom to do what they think is right. Because, like, if I, as the people, felt like I was wronged by the police, I would have a chance to sue them in court. And since they serve us, most of the time, the person will win. Because it's supposed to be you, you're serving them, you're paying them. Yeah. And things like that are based on, like, how you own the taxes. And so, at the same time, if they were their own private organization, things might work out a little bit better. Okay, okay, all right, so that's interesting. So uh, a lot of, so pretty much every single government agency has an immunity for being sued in a civil tort. Uh, a lot of police uh, officers have this uh, immunity too. Legally, they don't have an obligation to protect you. The only time they have an obligation to, to protect you is when you're, you're in their custody. Uh, so the thing about with the police officers, even if you do sue them, the money that you're going to be receiving actually comes from everyone else. That's right? why people get mad because they're paying for a yeah. lawsuit. And I feel like if that wasn't part of it, the, their own business would be paying for it. Right, exactly. So then that business has an incentive. We don't want to be sued, so we don't, have, we don't want to hire people who are going to uh, aggressively abuse people's rights, right? Because we don't want to get sued, otherwise we're out of business. And now you have a free market that anyone can p compete uh, to provide you a better service of security that we're not going to throw you into cages for victimless crimes, right? Uh, so for me, with, with the cops, so what if we, we get rid of a, you know, a crooked cop? So just replace him with another. I want that business to go bankrupt. I want the freedom to compete. I want the freedom to say, hey, go with us instead, <laughs> you know? We have a history of never abusing our customers, yeah. right? You're paying for our salaries, right? We're, we're here to serve you at your convenience. And if it's a private business, they have like a better chance of giving them better pay. So things like bribery would not yeah. happen. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Who, who's there to bribe, right? Because yes. there's no politician, there's no government, there's no one to bribe anymore, right? Um, a great example up to use is like Netflix. Like a year ago, they tried to raise their prices overnight, and people are like, oh, no, you didn't. They're like, oh, cancel, unsubscribe, go to Hulu, right? The power goes back into the consumer, right? So anytime you see a business trying to be shady or trying to do something unethical, you think they go bankrupt. Uh, a lot of people petition for sometimes like uh, on apps, on Apple. It's like, I don't like that particular app. It's very offensive, and people petition, and they remove it. And they didn't want to remove it because they want to you to continue going to Apple for those apps, for, for those phones, right? Uh, so one interesting thing about corporations and uh, free market, without government, there'd be no such thing as a corporation. Uh, all a corporation is, is a piece of paper granted by the government to allow you to escape personal responsibility for your actions, right? So like uh, the oil spill off the coast of Alaska, the CEOs didn't go to jail, they didn't lose their money, they didn't lose their house, they didn't lose anything. They they put off the cost because they only have a limited liability cap to the employees by lowering their salaries to the consumers by raising consumer prices. So without a government, it goes back to the way it used to be where they're held personally liable for their actions, for, for their mistakes. So they can't go off like walking across the street with their eyes closed knowing that they can't get hit. Right? So that's, that's how it would be um, in, in a free and voluntary society. Uh, and that's, that's how anarchy would work. Um, no, this is great. This is fun. Uh, <laughs> I, um, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It's a pleasure to meet you. Oh, my name is Cal. My name is Hannah. Hannah.
Well, let me give you a pamphlet then. Uh, I think you'll find... It's interesting, you have a lot of interesting questions about the legal system. Are you a criminal justice student major? No. no? Um, I want to be a pharmacist, and afterwards I'd like to go to law school to be a pharmaceutical lawyer. Right. So. All right, great. A lot of this stuff talks about ethics. Okay, so you're going to love all these books here. Uh, on the back here, on the additional resources. Talks about all the economics, talks a lot about a lot of the ethics, talks a lot about uh, especially the criminal system, uh, law system, and everything. Like that. I found it very beneficial for me when I was studying here at criminal justice at VCU. So, what do you do now? Uh, right now, I, I spread anarchy. I talk about this. Uh, for me, I, again, we we're talking about where it starts. It starts in our community. So I'm trying to help uh, everyone turn to our community and turn away from that monopoly of system that government has. So, Thank you. Of course, Thank take, you of course take good care. <laughs> global warming induced but only to a degree you know because it also has its own natural factors so like because I'm in a sustainability class right yeah uh, so we learn all about how to calculate those gases the effects of you know buying a Prius versus keeping your old junker right yeah so um, what are the cost changes so I, I'm still I don't have a position on all right, so it's human induced climate yeah. change because I'm not I'm not a scientist, right? So. Yeah. So two things will happen. Uh, so why right now it's uh, it's called weather. Right now they change their position. It's no longer called global warming. Now it's called global cooling uh, because the Arctic has uh, increased in mass over seventy percent recently. Like, uh, was that just something that just? Yeah. It's, oh wow. Yeah. The Earth goes in natural cycles. And so the reason why in the past they would want to say that um, it's global warming because then now you can force companies to pay certain carbon credits. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. We right? just started learning about <laughs> carbon credits. Yeah, yeah. Different ways to extort from businesses. And uh, the, first, the first thing that I said to my instructor when you started talking about this, I was like, where does the revenue come from? Right. I mean, if you can make carbon credits uh, profitable or like a, a commodity, then you can make anything a commodity, right? I right. Mean, like, <laughs> like where, I didn't understand it. I mean, I understood the incentive. You want to have a market mechanism to you know, motivate these companies to retrofit, but... Yeah, and you'll find in every single bill, this is Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, the exception out of all these pieces of legislation in the back, when you flip that big volume of laws over, Every single politician has their exception for the uh, co corporation that funds them. So the clean water bill applies to everyone except for these companies. Oh, so yeah, in course. a way, now you limit competition because now the smaller companies, it's yeah. hard for them to compete because they have to, they have to uh, so that's retrobate. that's what it's really about. Yeah. Uh, okay, so it's not the fact that libertarians are disputing global warming, whether it's real or not. It's more about uh, governance. Yes. induced policies and reactions. Yeah, more state control. So, like uh, the way how it would work, how how it will work when you get rid of government. Uh, so, for example, you don't want pollution in your water. You don't want pollution in the air in the home you live in. You just uh, include in your home insurance policy that you know you just want uh, no pollution policy, right? And so the insurance company, there's a community of people who have the same kind of policy. So, for example, if a factor were to come and set up, uh, and they're going to buy out this land for like a hundred thousand dollars. The insurance company is like, well, it's, 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 it's in our best interest to buy that land out for $100,000 and sell it for something else, rather than to pay everybody out a million dollars uh, because when they found out there's pollution in the air, because now we just reneged on our contract. I have to be somewhere. So that's how you pre prevent pollution coming into your water, coming into your... And but then would you ever get the factories built? Uh, they'll become probably more efficient. Maybe they'll, they'll do it in space. Maybe they'll uh, find different ways to, to go about uh, creating things. Uh, one of the coolest things I did learn in this class so far was about the sustainability class is that like the amount of energy produced, you lose like 97% of the amount of energy like, that a coal factory would use like by burning the coal, heating the water, like you lose 97% of that energy uh, by the time it gets to the light bulb in your house, right. like just through waste. So, that's pretty bad. I mean like... It's been how many years since the Industrial Revolution? We haven't, yeah. you know, at least increased it like a percent more efficient. Like, yeah, we had fluorescent light bulbs, but well, that's not changing the 
power yeah. source, right? So you so. can look at uh, the, the way cars are designed. They haven't really changed. Like yeah. the engines and stuff like that. You can look at a computer every two years. It's like, <laughs> yeah, like really. the memory, all that stuff. Yeah. So you look at, uh, of course, you have the oil industry. You have the connection with politicians. Wants to make sure that this is still an oil-based economy. And you have the car industry that's still attached to that. So, of course, a lot of their technology is still based on that old uh, form of fossil fuel. So, of course, they want to make sure that, te that te technology in the market is still stagnating so they can still kind of reap a lot of money from that. So, of course, without the state regulations and state-backed corporations, uh, you free up a lot of different ways to innovate. You, I mean, like, for example, Tesla cars, electronic yeah. cars, they're trying to compete in North Carolina for the, uh, I guess, the automotive industry are trying to uh, help the, t telling the legislators there, the politicians, not to let them in the market because they're going to put us out of business because they're trying to do a different sales model and that they'll sell the car directly to you, to the consumer, without the middleman of a, of a car in, uh, sales industry. Uh, so you don't have to go to the parking lot or anything like that. They'll bring you straight to you, you know, at your convenience. Uh, no middleman. And so you'll find like, a lot of these companies still trying to, uh, and it naturally makes sense, you know, in this form of condition of the survival of the fittest, you know, because they're discovering they're trying to vie for the government power to outcompete their competitors. So without a government, there's no one to outcompete. It goes back to the poly of whether you have a good service or not. So, but at the same time, it prevents new technology from coming in, uh, new ways of uh, transport and um, innovative and, and design. This is one in. of the reasons why, I, the biggest reasons I like urban planning is because I hate the way that we train. I was talking about it with uh, this, uh, a student in my band from Korea. He's like, uh, we were driving through Chesterfield, like right by the Chesterfield Town Center to get to this place. And, and he's like, so you live here? I'm like, yeah, yeah. He's like, I was like, yeah, but I hate it, you know, because it takes 10 minutes to do like a little circle around this like little mall traffic area. And he's like, why did you live, why did you move here? Oh, I grew up here, blah, blah, blah. But he's like, well, what would you do to change it? And I was like, I would extend the bus route down Huguenot Road and down in Chesterfield. And, blah, blah. and uh, he's like, well, why haven't they done that already? And I was like, because the way Chesterfield gets there, red tax revenue is for property taxes, but people having cars. More cars, more tax revenue uh, yeah. to replace losses and whatnot. You know, uh, public schools and whatnot. You know, just the, also, that's another thing, the number of students in the public schools. Do you know this? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. You already know this. So, um, it's based on the budget. So, it's just, you would, you would think they would come up with a new form of, ma you know, making revenue, um, but you know it's just a status quo. And, and this is what I, this is playing in urban planning, in, uh, urban environments throughout the country. And we're the only country in the world where the suburbs are more populated than the city centers. Yeah. It's just uh, maybe because of the policies. Like this. Yeah. Their uh, great example is DC. Uh, so they have a law in the books. Uh, so a lot of people think you can't build buildings taller than the Washington Monument. It's actually you can't build taller, larger than the building across the street from you, plus 20 feet, uh, plus like the length of the width of uh, the stretch of between you and the building. Uh, so this is why they can't. You can't. You don't have high rises. You don't have skyscrapers. Yeah. So this then forces people who want to move in in densely populated areas to go out. Uh, so naturally yeah. it makes sense that well, let's just build tall, let's we'll build high, right? But government gets in the way of that and this is why now you have more <laughs> traffic issues on the outlying skirts yeah. of DC and DC becomes like the third congested traffic system in the country, yeah. you know? For a city that doesn't have that large population next to like Los I mean, Angeles. Even, or even if you did increase the dwelling units, would people move back or would they have left in the first place? Right. I wonder. Um, because there's this like, overwhelming like American dream of having you know a big yard a house with one car and for the dogs and the kids to play and it's just like this uh, I don't know like yeah it's freedom of choice but how how far does that go I mean yeah we have tons of land right to use uh, but it's not efficient. I mean, even if you yeah. had a free market, it wouldn't be efficient to get your workers to wherever they need to go. Well, I guess you have so. a lot of telecommunication. Uh, and also, I guess, like, again, uh, in places in England where they already removed the traffic signs and traffic lights and traffic congestion went down, there's a woman who say, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And it's like, all right. And then she came back, okay, I believe it. Yeah. <laughs> a a trip that, that costs like 20, 20 minutes to get to uh, took her five minutes. You know, just yeah. cut down considerably. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of that kind of problem. But they also, didn't they also, uh, when they 
took out the traffic lights and stuff, they also implemented a bike lane and uh, other they just, they just removed the roads. I mean, uh, they, they removed the sidewalks. It just becomes a shared traveling experience. Yeah. So any, everyone's traveling, people are walking, people yeah. are driving. Yeah. Um, and you have a lot of eye contact with each other while you're driving. Yeah. You know, you're not paying attention to the light. Yeah. <laughs> or it means go even faster. We, ju we just watched a documentary <laughs> about that, about how people uh, are just like, like they spend hours and hours inside their little bubble inside their cars and it's you know creating an increasingly impersonal you know, environment uh, people have no civic engagement they don't feel as responsibility yeah uh, as they naturally would not not as like they should be you know right I'm saying, uh, naturally And of course, there's no wonder people are on their cell phones and, and, and driving because like it takes so long. What else are they going to do? It's some kind of social oh, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, and then you're going to tax that. Yeah. <laughs> and a uh, criminal justice class here. Um, so that the assignment was uh, to follow the pieces of legislation that are coming here out of Virginia. They already passed about cell phone uses while driving. And uh, it was like, if you were in charge, uh, what kind of regulation, what kind of law would you pass? You know, what would the fine be? And uh, they split it up into groups. It's like, whoa. I was like, there's no other option. Um, you know, every group trying to decide, well, I'll, I'll, we'll do a $200 fine, uh, you know, maybe first time offense. And uh, I was like, nobody even thought uh, about not finding it. No, how about not finding it? So yeah, in my group, I was like, hey guys, um, I mean, if you, are, you, are you comfortable pulling someone over with a gun and uh, taking their money? You know, then don't pass it off to someone else to do it for you if you can't do it yourself, right? Uh, uh, yeah, I love that. I love those arguments. Right? Because those are the easiest ones to really. To uh, emphasize, that, right? yeah, it's the, hip, the contradictory argument. Instead of just saying, "Oh, that's wrong," you know, like, yeah, <laughs> well, morally, you're like taxes. Can wrong. you point the yeah. gun at your friends or family and take their money? <laughs> if you can, I think it's really important that they don't know this. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, of course, you go to uh, the traffic laws and uh, that they've removed the lights in, in Europe and signs, and then the traffic congestion went down, and that means that you're not really on your phone. You know, your your eye contact is with each other, so you, there's no accidents. Tra traffic accidents went down. So if, if the problem is just because the distraction leads to traffic accidents, then I think the greatest cause of that is government with their uh, central planning with the uh, with the lights and the stop signs. But of course, you don't, you don't want that because if you did do that, you lose a source of revenue uh, from all the people you could find and take their two hundred dollars away from them and to find a lot of uh, government services. How much, how much do you think collusion economics affects these problems? Like, when, like, would you? I mean, how much would you attribute Keynesian style economics to the problems? I mean, inherent with Spain, I guess. For them to, like, are they man and wife? You know, like, can you have one without the other to, to run a, an effective state without them? Like, oh. I mean, is Keynesian economics really a form of economics, or is it just the economics of the state? Uh, Keynesian economics? Yeah. Uh, so, one one's, well, I guess they're, they're both hand in hand. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's every single little effect that government does uh, has a butterfly effect that affects everything else. Yeah. Uh, like for and example, it comes back right back. Right, yeah. like like buying a shirt. Like for example, you go to like a, this is tax free weekend. What you don't know is that there's import tax. There's taxes on the on the equipment that created your shirt, that created your hat. There's taxes on the on the fabric, on the resources. Uh, so all that stuff has to be approved. This is why sometimes things cost so much. This is why uh, good food costs so much because a lot of the farmers have to subsidize all the regulations that's forced on them specifically, not on corporations that are factory farming, just on them. Uh, and so that's why it costs so much. Uh, whereas uh, that's, that's not what would happen then. You know, these, the natural equilibrium of prices will go back down, but whenever government affects any area of industry, you have this butterfly negative effect affecting everything else. Um, I guess in, in towards the cost, towards allocating resources, towards trying to make up for what you just lost in that revenue and giving up to the state. Yeah, because Keynesian, Keynesian economics doesn't make sense in a free market. Right? You wouldn't need deficit spend yeah. to, you know, and you wouldn't steal, I mean, where would you get the revenue, if, even if someone would loan it to you? Um, and you, with, with no intention of paying it back, like, it's just... Yeah, it's kind of like, so they look at hurricanes as a, as a job creation, uh, 
You know, it's going to destroy all these buildings and all these, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's going to create jobs. <laughs> Can't wait for the next one. Yeah, uh, uh, the uh, military industry is right. kind of set up that way. Uh, that's why if you have wars, you create jobs and defense contractors. Uh, and that's, that's the pretty much easiest one to uh, kind of expose. Yeah. Whereas in a free and voluntary society, it would be the complete opposite. The fact that uh, no one robbed you when you have a good sense of security is what, hey, actually I'm doing a good job providing good security, right? Uh, that, that, that this loss hasn't come up. So key economics is kind of like somebody walking, this is from uh, economics uh, one lesson, somebody's walking and uh, throws a rock at a business window and it breaks. Oh yeah, I saw the YouTube video. Yeah, and people will come in and say, oh, you know, that, that sucks. It's like, yeah, but oh, now you just created a job for a window maker. Yeah, yeah. But then you don't realize that the cost of the business could have created you like tailoring a new suit. That's great, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, so that's Keatsian economics in a nutshell. It's a, it's a Marxist uh, childlike view of how the world works. But for them it makes sense. And that's why they try to come up with a lot of uh, interesting, creative, complicated terms to describe it. Quantitative easing. Uh, and just to hide the fact yeah, that... Change. Yeah. yeah, they change a lot with money. The depression, for example, was caused uh, by all that too. Um, I mean, what do you think is going to happen if you raise tariffs on foreign <laughs> goods? They're going to do the same thing with American goods. And eventually it goes so far high that the people here in this uh, government cage can't buy lower quality of goods. And eventually they start defaulting on their, uh, they can't buy any more, uh, like for farmers for example, they can't buy any more or crops, they can't buy any more tools. Then they, they can't make uh, a business out of that. They start defaulting on the loans and then the banks start defaulting too and just cause a real dominoes from the effect of government intervening in that market. And that's that's what caused the depression. It's the government trying to get in the way. I was, I was listening to Dan Carlin. He's like a historian. He has podcasts that I listen to alongside his stuff. What's his name? Dan, Dan Carlin. Dan Carlin? Yeah, he's awesome. He's, uh, you got to definitely have to check out the, the Roman and the Mongolian podcast. I mean, they're super long, but... No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm into so that stuff. I eat that stuff too. up. It's <laughs> so interesting how the, Mon the Mongolian Empire affected the world and like, history. Uh, but anyway... Uh, he was talking about uh, Cuba uh, and the American involvement in Cuba and the one I'm listening to now. He was talking about how private banking interests in the, the late uh, like 1890s were already talking about, uh, yeah, because everything was backed by gold and then there was like clamoring that uh, to introduce silver into it and backing the dollar with silver. Right. And that was like a big uproar about that. And then, what he said, how that affected the Federal Reserve Bank, you know, but maybe I haven't gotten that for you. But do, do you know anything about that process? Is like how that started? Like wh why? Well, I, why would they have thought that was, was a good idea? You know, like right. were they running out of gold, or was it they just wanted a deficit spend because they couldn't afford all of these wars? I mean, because Cuba, you know, yeah, 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 kind of yeah. started the. And sorry, last last thing. Did you know Theodore Roosevelt was like a no. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay. Well, yeah. please enlighten me. What, yeah. what have you heard? He, he believed in like uh, phrenology and that you know the white white race was superior. And, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah, and that. I guess that kind of makes sense. He, he, he gave a speech at like a women's uh, rights, whatever, or voters. He was he was maybe getting votes when he was not for president, but for when he was maybe a politician. He made a speech that said something like, "Your sons are bred for you know war. You know they're not supposed to you know grow up and just be." You know, this that was basically the gist of it. it just, and they all clapped and cheered and supported it. And this was like what Dan Kyle was basically saying. This was the mindset. You know, that was extreme nationalism, extreme patriotism. And that's why you know we sort of supported the Cuban rebels. And it was like the first time the media frenzy was really like active as far as yeah. It was, it was really interesting. That was kind of the turning point. Uh, in huh. But um, more along the line. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess I, I got to look a little bit more into that myself. I was just curious. Uh, I, I do remember reading something about, like, especially during the uh, Civil War, uh, Lincoln put a tax on competing currencies. So if anyone were to use any other currency except for the U.S. dollar, there's like a 10% tax on it. Uh, so that's kind of already sitting up in the way that they they're trying to deter everyone else from not using uh, anything but the U.S. dollar. 
uh, taxing other goods, other commodities, and trying to tax uh, competing uh, currency against the U.S. dollar. And uh, this Sanders Spooner talked a lot about that too. And uh, yeah, he was very adamant against that. So I, I would imagine that's kind of how it was kind of set up. Uh, you know, that one little, again, it's pretty much how it, you, it makes sense. I mean, yeah. in the Civil War period, you're trying to make the Union come back together. Force people to, to yeah, associate. Course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the freedom to assemble and disassemble, that is if it's in the government. <laughs> yeah. And that's pretty much what the, the Civil War was about, just collecting taxes. Uh, they blockade the forest because the South is still we want to be a part of it anymore. Uh, not so much that had anything to do about um, slavery or anything like that. I mean, the rest of the world again I guess, I mean, didn't, didn't need a war to end slavery. Um, yeah. yeah, that's true. Huh? <laughs> right? Yeah. They just stopped. They just stopped. It was, naturally, the, the argument for morality is just like, it's kind of bad. It just kind of just naturally let go. And they just stopped. All over the world, they just stopped. But the North saw the opportunity to kind of. Yeah. As Factor. Yeah, it's a trick. So, for example, uh, well, they didn't even come up because if they're going to say the emancipation of, uh, of slaves in the South, then it should be everywhere. Except, actually, in the North, they were still allowed to have slaves. So, it's interesting, like, especially where a lot of these exceptions where we are today with, like, uh, you know, like we were talking about the Constitution, where they kind of do uh, exceptions to the powers that they're, they're supposed to be contained within. You know, Lincoln suspending habeas corpus, uh, kidnapping anyone who opposes ideas and opinions in the state of Maryland, because Maryland was also a southern state. Uh, oh, is that how they switched? Yeah, <laughs> they forced them. Oh, no. <laughs> I thought that was a voluntary thing. No. That's why, that's what, that's the one. Yeah. Well, the, the capital of DC, DC oh, yeah. is right you there. You can't have yeah. Maryland <laughs> going south. Okay. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting though, like uh, I love to pick up a high school history book and just kind of go through it. It's like wrong, 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 no, no. But of course, is that revisionist history? What, yeah, what, it's what revisionist. Is, what is the definition of revisionist history? Because Dan Carlin talks about it all the time. I never actually looked it up. Like, I think it's that, right? Yeah, I guess it's kind of average high school textbook that's George Washington. Yeah, well, yeah. I guess it's kind of like, uh, again, if you had a, a Microsoft school. Uh, and an Apple school, of course, Microsoft would say all great stuff about Microsoft and say some negative stuff about Apple, maybe a blurb here about it and just kind of ignore them about the rest about that because you don't want to introduce them about Apple. Uh, or, you know, you don't <laughs> I wanna, see, I see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you don't want to introduce any of these ideas to, to the students there. Uh, and of course, on the, on the wall, you'll see past former presidents of Apple or, I mean, Microsoft. Um, and, that's, and that's all you'll learn. Uh, and that's pretty much in the same way with a lot of philosophers, uh, like in public schools, you never hear about Lysander Spooner because you don't want to introduce that idea. It indoctrination. And, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's not revisionist history, it's just indoctrination, but they can't call it that. Because revisionist sounds like a good thing, right? Like yeah. you're redoing the typical Like it's history. a reform. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> you're opening people's eyes. If, if you call it for what it is, people will understand the true nature of the relationship that they have with government and the people wouldn't want that. So the whole trick of it is to hide that relationship, uh, obscure it, uh, define it by more abstract concepts. Okay, what about, here, I'm going to throw another one at you. Yeah. Multiculturalism. Multi Diversity. You know, like, does the state really Or like these, the programs like, are there any other integrative you know, government policies that right. kind of force? I, I think yeah, I think that's interesting because uh, it kind of brings up the uh, uh, like you're talking about affirmative action. So the whole point of like a lot of these indoctrination schools is to turn into a collective form of mind, uh, a hive like a board that the actions of people in the past you're also responsible for that. Uh, yeah. And so that's uh, so. For example, they're trying they, they try to turn it into a, a guilt kind of trip, where you're responsible for other people's actions, even though you have no connection, even if you've never met them, even if you weren't born here at the time, and try to have a collective sense of tie to that particular group of people. Uh, which is where affirmative action comes from. Uh, so, for example, and for me, I find it kind of insulting, anyways. 
uh, for, for anyone who kind of sees their affirmative action to be any kind of good because in a way it says that you can't uh, achieve something good on your own merits mm -hmm. that you need a government handout uh, a, a step up on the ladder to achieve something that you perhaps uh, couldn't have done without their help so in a way it's still so some kind of discrimination into thinking that something's superior and something's inferior um, and that's of course government created uh, what if there's no alternative for a person to say uh, they have the black and the kids and the white and there's no other alternative in getting an income and the only way you can get a job is through this like because you, you even had a podcast that was like you can still be not what if you work for the state yeah if you work yeah, for yeah, the yeah. state you can still be you know abide by an yes, AP yes. And, and then so, I guess that's the conundrum. Yeah. Right? So. so the most, I guess, uh, and that's and that's the thing, and that's the nature uh, of the cage that we're in, right? That we already are in a cage, and that's why I don't advocate for violence. Like, why put yourself further into a cage and we already live in a cage to begin with? That's my name. Nice friend, also. Hi. Hey, how you doing? Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hey. Yeah. How you doing? Yeah. Uh, talking about King Cal philosophy. Uh, uh, and I guess in the capacity of us, uh, even if you work for the state, you know, the first point of it is like not to put yourself in a position now that you can't feed your family, you can't self-sustain, uh, especially realizing it at the point that um, now you can come to understand where you are um, in relation to the nature of the relationship towards the state. So, but there's a lot of different things you can do right now, right? Uh, you can let go of the idea of the violence to set us free. Uh, you can let go of the idea of spanking your children, you know, peaceful parenting. There's a lot of morality of stuff you can do. But the most thing that people need to understand is on your own recognizance, when you're ready to let go uh, for the state. You know, oh, that's okay. that's yeah, your it's own be a process, right? Yeah. Because you're already kind of uh, behind. Yeah. You know, you're so far behind in self-empowerment and yeah. enlightenment that you can't, you know, you're going to have to kind of... Unplug where you yeah. can. Yeah. yeah. And then when you're ready, no one else can tell you. It's when you're, when you're ready on that, whether it takes two years or five years, that's, that's a path that only you can decide. No one else can tell you otherwise. And then when you're ready to unplug and, and embrace the free market, go for it. Right? So that's pretty much the, uh, the action plan uh, for that particular area. Because for the most part, that's usually what happens. Uh, when, you know, when governments has a monopoly on a lot of services, they get a lot of people uh, dependent on those services. Yeah. And then they get dependent too, too much, it's hard to escape. It's hard to unplug immediately. Um, and that's just uh, a sober uh, response to the, the way how it is right now. So it's not like, uh, quit your job immediately or anything yeah, like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just uh, realize the true nature of the monopoly of the service of the government because the thing is, it's not going to last. You know, if you work for United States Postal Service, for example, uh, they're $60 billion in debt, right? Uh, it's not going to be long before they go bankrupt. If you work for Social Security or if you think you're going to be dependent on Social Security, you'll never see that in your lifetime. Right, so prepare the, for the inevitable. But the idea of bankruptcy is illusion, right? It's like yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So it'll. Now let's imagine Dan. I mean, if, if you understood that much, then you would still be comfortable. Well, what? Well, yeah, well, so, so uh, you, you'll be comfortable. Yeah, but the thing is, uh, there's only three percent left of the value of the dollar left. Over ninety-seven percent is gone. So get ready for the transition. Oh, so there's only so long before other. Yeah, before it collapse. Uh, this happens to, to Rome. This happens to every single uh, government controlled city like Detroit. All those people working in Detroit file for bankruptcy. They're like, well, where's my pension plan? It's like, look, you made a bad, bad thinking that you're going to get something uh, sustainable through government. I mean, right? They're still trying to get their pension. There's a lawsuit. In there. Yeah. But this, they're not going to go anywhere. Uh, and that's what I mean. You made a bad bet with that. It's unfunded liabilities. And the position where you are right now, realize the situation that you are with recovering. Like working for NASA, for example, they're already cutting back a lot of uh, public outreach programs. It's, just, it's just inevitable that the whole thing starts getting cut. And to actually look for something real sustainable, something of, uh, that matches your, your values and your, your integrity in, in the free market. And it should try to, to explore, to take that risk. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's the direction where it has to go. What, what's your name? It's public administration. Public administration? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How do yeah, you we're, like we're in the research that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, I just introduced you to that. It's okay. Uh, yeah. I was in the same program. I, I applied for it. I just recently switched to urban planning. But I, I was always more interested in urban sociology anyway. So, uh, but, uh, But yeah, but that's, but that's the transition. Go to something that's sustainable. Something where you can find uh, self-sustainability, right? Independence. Uh, you know, the only way you can really be free at that point is it's actually to create your own business at that point. So explore that option. Do a Kickstarter campaign. You know, as this community grows, you have a lot of support. You have a lot of connections. You yeah, watch out for the algorithm there. Be far from, from government. Yeah, you do like <laughs> <laughs> huh? What do you say? Be far from government. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, and so and in a way, it's uh, that's that's an actionable plan now um, to to prepare yourself for that and the tradition outside of that. Um, especially if you think that you're like, for example, that you're going to you're going to have that pension plan, like again in Detroit. Eventually, that's going to reach all over the city. Like for example, in Cyprus, the uh, the government took off like what 10, 50 percent of everyone's savings from the banks. Yeah. Right. Well, the banks Gone. crashed, right? Yeah, the banks crashed, stole it. So that's what yeah. I mean. Prepare yourself for this stuff. You know, don't keep your money in, in a lot of these banks. Put it in a different uh, the areas. Put it in Bitcoin, something that the government can reach and touch. Just prepare for for, for the coming collapse that, that's inevitable. Uh, already, a lot of city states in Europe are already falling. Uh, San Clemente is next, and falling into default. Philadelphia is next. Uh, just becomes inevitable that it's like you know to have a sober, realistic outlook on these. It's like you know the best bet is no longer a government. It's just, Get, get ready for that and, and try to do try to revamp your uh, trade and bartering skills you know your sharper your entrepreneurial skills um, because uh, at least that, that sort of stuff will become kind of re recession proof uh, in that aspect because you're, you're already in that mode you're already uh, you already had this uh, tacit experience and knowledge in how to trade with people in a free market without being dependent on the government and that will help set you up for, for that transition first time we got us <laughs> uh, but if, if we talk all day, then we're not going to have anything to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> no, I can talk about anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's, I mean, I, like, I have a lot of friends who work for the government too. So that's, that's, that's the apparition. I have some friends in the military who still, who still get military benefits. But now they come to the position where uh, that's the trade-off, right? You're trading some, some scrap that the government gives you in benefits for the trade-off when you get rid of government. You'll have an explosion of free market opportunities. Yeah. Uh, free market of a uh, trade-off that uh, you'll find in a free and voluntary society uh, versus the small, you know, coins that government, you know, tosses her away. You know. so, where are you from? Iraq. Iraq? Yeah. <laughs> Let's hear your perspective. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You've lived through it. You know, right? people, so. people, you know, government uh, in my country made people to uh, don't think about anything else um, except government and they they all should or must depend on government for everything yeah. <laughs> you know yeah this is how uh, eastern countries deal with their people yeah you know they are they are obeying or they are um. uh, you know there is a there is a way and you have to go by this way, not going to any other way. Right? Yeah, you know, that's yeah. This why make people don't think beyond <laughs> those things that government put uh, on it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. That's same thing here too. Uh, a lot of the education, for example, I was a criminal justice major here, and you're only allowed to think within the government monopoly of law, government monopoly of security. Of course, you're not allowed to think outside of that. Polycentric system, um, and of course, when you have a situation when the government does collapse, when everyone was, de was dependent on the services they force upon you, they didn't allow room for other people That's to right. create a better That's service. That's right. I think all governments do that in different ways. Yeah. You know, governments made people uh, to think about some 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 small thing that's not important in their life. They some small needs, some needs that it's simple needs. Yeah. Like um, you know, having house, having car. Those are simple things for human. But governments made them so big. Yeah. And made people to just think about those stuff and don't think about some other things that governments do. Oh. That governments, you know. Yeah. It, 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 it can create this distraction. Yeah. Government distract people from what they want to do, what they plan to do. Yeah. A lot of people say that, like George Zimmerman case. Yeah. They say it was fake, just to keep people distracted from the drone strikes and yeah. everything that's going on. Uh, maybe. So. 
don't know. <laughs> you, you look at uh, that's the best time to for politicians to try to hide something is when a big event is going on. Then they'll try to do something on the side. Oh, yeah, NDAA. Uh, yeah, yeah. NDAA happened yeah. during uh, where people were celebrating, having fun on New Year's Eve, and then the National Defense Authorization was back on the same day. Kind of like the Tet Offensive, um, where you have a, a big you know, during the distraction of the holiday holidays when they attacked. Yeah, in Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you look at major distractions to pass like stuff that you don't want people to hear because now they're distracted with something else and uh, that's what government does you know you, you play into the media media there's a uh, it's a big uh, culprit behind a lot of that stuff too uh, they're the ones who are publishing the news and splashing the big headlines you know for the distraction so and then the thing with most of the media is that they, they cater to the government a lot of them are most of them are not really as um, investigative as they used to be yeah. right taking the time to explore you know objectively now they just kind of eat what the government hands out and they just regurgitate that back they feed off each other right? yeah I, I heard like 80 percent of news feeds were fed off of each other like, yeah. the main the national headlines were just that's why they're always wrong right or there yeah. something comes out after because it's just word of mouth of what you know, what did fox say what did say? Yeah. yeah you know so there's limited some, sources yeah there's some important news actually it's important news is around the world i don't see it in american news in american stations uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is another way that maybe american governments don't want to uh, share yeah. some other uh, things beyond the American border. Actually, good point. Good point. Also, like Time Magazine just put out uh, their, their yeah, recent so magazine of Putin uh, trying to uh, trying to stop the war in Syria. Uh, the same picture was in Europe and Asia, all, uh, like South South America. But when I came here to the U.S., it was about it's time to go back into school. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no Putin picture, nothing like More that. More student loan debt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point, yeah. <laughs> that is a big distraction from it. Yeah. So, tell us a little bit about, I mean, I just met a, a girl this morning. Um, she wasn't from Iraq, but she lived there for five years. And she was uh, presenting to uh, senior citizens, so to practice English. Yeah. So we, I, I drove a bunch of Saudis and Korean students and to uh, a community center of senior, senior citizens, old people, yeah. and they give a presentation about their home country. And she did Iraq. You know, and she talked a lot about the economy and uh, northern Iraq and uh, Kurdistan. Yeah. Uh, she didn't talk too much about war. Um, I guess she didn't maybe want to start that conversation. But I definitely started it. Was she from <laughs> Kurdistan or she was from another? Was she Kurd or Arab? I don't know. Maybe she is Kurd, that's why. <laughs> she I can't just remember where she said she was about. born, but she lived in Iraq and uh, Baghdad and then she moved to Qatar. Do you know what's her name? Shams? Shams. Yeah, she's young. She's like yeah, 17. Actually, yeah, all Iraqi people proud of Kurdistan because it's one of the most. It's not Beautiful. just. It's the only. Uh, place in Iraq that people live in peace yeah. and people uh, can you know invest people can do what they want to do there is a freedom in speech freedom in uh, vote you know but in another part of Iraq you know because of sectarian violation people they don't know are they gonna leave afternoon are they gonna live in two hours because every time there is you you are expecting to 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 be in a uh, in in the in the in explosion sense right you now because you now people are very tired in, in the southern part and north uh, central part of Iran. yeah but it's totally different in our region i heard that they they've cut uh she was saying how they cut Baghdad in half and one side of the city is Shia and one side is Sunni and if the Shia want to go to the Sunni side they have to pay a tax and they at some, to, at oh, wow. some yeah like at some point it was like that but the, they build a uh, block like belly block <laughs> between oh, yeah. sorry, between between yeah. Shia uh, yeah, Shia yeah. population and Sunni population in the same city like it's kind of like what the Israeli try to do with Palestine and creating a, a wall or a block between the two. Um, I have a friend named Aladdin. He's also from Iraq here. 
Um, yeah, I know. You're, you're familiar? Know. Yeah, yeah, good guy, good guy. Uh, yeah, we talk a lot too about, about the sort of stuff about the problems with government too. Uh, yeah, and he also agrees is that you know the way the government controls a lot of the services, and of course when government's gone, they're, they disappear because he didn't allow the community at the time to have a transition to take over these services and provide yeah. free market solutions to these things. Um, so I was just uh, mentioning uh, something in the news, well, I guess with Obama uh, in Syria, for example, saying that they have chemical weapons and that's why they're going to attack them. Uh, but of course, it's a contradiction because uh, Israeli, uh, come to my understanding, also used chemical weapons too uh, a year ago, but they're not being attacked. And of course, the United States also used chemical weapons in Iraq uh, with depleted uranium. And that toxicity of uh, the weapons that the United States military uses has caused a lot of deaths. Um, a lot, a lot of. Um, Actually, sorry, I interrupt you, but Iraqi government used those chemical weapons against us. Right. Because in Iraq, because we keep asking for our right in Iraq, our freedom, not liberating, not, uh, I mean, separating our free. parts from Iraq, just yeah. be free. Yeah. Iraq used chemical attack, used chemical weapon against us. Right. And at that point, no, no any Western countries, including the United States, asked Saddam, why you kill these innocent people? Right, yeah, right. It's arbitrary. Uh, we'll why? Why they are asking? Why, why, no, I don't know. And, and they don't forget that the United States military gave Iraq those chemical weapons in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. They still and have the receipts. Some Western countries. Yeah. Uh, until now, we are not sure about United States. Uh, if United States gave those weapons to Iraq, but there is some Western, some European countries that uh, involved. Yeah. So. You know. The legal arms trade, right? The, not the yeah. black arms. You know, yeah, yeah. Legal. Well, now if we came back to our uh, major point, you know, everything is benefit. Countries, governments, and those stuff is a is a things that uh, they are uh, just wanting their benefits, wanting their the official, the big head yeah. benefit, not for people's benefit. It's not. It's at your expense. Yeah, that's true. That's the point. Well, thank you for sharing with us. Thank you so much. Good thank to see you. you. Hope to see you again. Absolutely. And you have 10 minutes to go. Our class <laughs> needs to, I think, 10 minutes to walk. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll talk to you. Good to see you. All right, Johnny. Take okay. care, man. We'll talk Friday, man. Take care, guys. Liberate RBA!